let me open my remarks by, uh, I think that I wish to express our collective uh, gratitude to Roger for being so innovative and be so hardworking and sustaining all the uh, difficulties that we encountered in the creation of this network. And I'd like to ask everybody to give a good hand to Roger. I hope that this network will uh, uh, provide a platform for uh, good discussion on the issue of uh, expectation coordination. And we all know what the questions are. We all wish to have a good answer for these questions. But we also recognize that we have different approaches to the question. We have different views of what the road that we need to take to solve the issue. And my job here is to try to present the perspective of the rational belief perspective on the issue of expectation coordination. And I'm going to take a fairly much more radical approach than my previous speaker. Uh, my purpose is to integrate the theory into a general equilibrium framework so we can discuss real economic issues and real problems. So let me lay out quite upfront what the perspective is. And that is we believe that expectation coordination is not possible. Uh, on any important variable that you look at, uh, expectation for inflation, uh, growth, uh, stock prices, whatever subject you want, you will find broad distributional difference of opinions which never merge. Instead of studying the attempt to coordinate expectations, we should study the implications of failure to coordinate on allocations and prices. And uh, the perspective that I will discuss today, which is the rational belief approach, will explore the implication to pricing and allocation. I will argue that market belief is an independent force causing fluctuations. It expands the, space, the state space of the economy and changes the nature of market uncertainty. And it forces agents to forecast the market belief in the future because that is the basis by which equilibrium will move over time. And i.e., the, the dynamics of prices will depend upon market belief, and therefore, if you want to forecast prices, you have to forecast market belief. And no private information is either necessary for that or used. I will argue that this type of economy is not an error de brew economy, and I, then I will review some applications, how to use, how we use the theory. I will present a very general perspective, and I'll try to stick to a simple uh, uh, version of the theory as I can. There are a variety of colleagues and friends who work with different models, with different level of generality, and they will vary in, in details, but I think that I will outline the general ideas uh, here. So let me go straight to the issue and let's say, let's consider an, the, a, an exogenous process V. My starting point is that it's common knowledge that no one knows the truth. No one knows the true probability distribution pi that guides that process. The economy, in my view of the world, is not a time-invariant process. A time-invariant process, you can run in history, you can run history forward, or you can run it backwards, you will get the same history. That's not possible in our reality. Our reality is one in which the economy only moves forward in time. It is a sequence of structures due to technology and change institutions and social institutions. And I describe it for simplicity in this case, for a simple Markov process, give you a description of the process of V as a Markov process which has these parameters which are changing over time. These represent the changing structures and therefore the expectations on the, the true probability pi is lambda vv plus this 
value S of t, which no one observed, no one knows. People know that the truck structure is changing, but they don't know how they are changing. Now, we assume that agents have a lot of past information, and we also assume the property called statistical stability, which actually means something very simple. It means that there is an empirical distribution. It means moments converge. It means that you can do statistics. As a result of that, well, and that can be done. You can actually do it in two different methods. One, which is common in economics, which is known under the Stock-Watson techniques. And that is you, you, you compute moments and, 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 and deduce transitions from that. Or else you compute relative frequencies on finite dimensional cylinders, create a measure, and then extend it. At the end, you get an empirical probability m. The probability M is the skeleton of the theory. It's a central point, and what is important to realize, and that is the, the empirical probability, what you will get by looking at the empirical frequency, is not the truth. It is some other probability M, which I will point in, the, in a second, is just the averaging of the changing structures in reality. It is common knowledge that there is no private information. So now I need to talk a little bit about what this non-judgmental probability M is all about. First of all, it is a time invariant, which is stationary probability. And I will assume for the sake of discussion here, here, just for the discussion here, for the simplicity, again, it's all single dimension, no multi-dimensions. And that is that this is the stationary probability that people will compute from the data. Which means the S's, as I have just specified, S's have an infinite, it's an infinite sequence with mean zero. And therefore, it is not surprising that we get this empirical probability. And if you made forecast in accordance with the empirical probability, you will make an expectation. Your expectation will be only this, because you don't know what the S's is. Now, how is it possible that this will be the average of that? Well, it only requires simple fact that the empirical distribution of these two together is the same as the empirical distribution of this. That's all. How this can happen? Well, there are many ways it can happen. First of all, ST, the, 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 ST, the sequence ST, will have statistical properties as if it was a realization of an IID process. Another possibility is that it's some, actually a Markov process. And the Markov process has coefficient lambda st, which are randomly selected over time, fluctuating between minus 1, plus 1. And the uh, uh, epsilon has been 0. That's another possibility. In fact, that you can actually rationalize this with even a constant probability, with a constant coefficient lambda s, and then require that the limit distribution of this sum is an IID process. And to make sure that you understand how this can happen is I did not make the assumption that this is IID. I didn't require this IID. So that can uh, 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 have other properties which I don't have time to go in detail into. But you can imagine that there are many processes that can, can achieve that uh, consequence. Now comes the individual and face this reality and, and needs to make a decision of how to form a belief. A belief, diversity can arise whenever there is some fundamental common knowledge of ignorance. And the ignorance here is about the true probability pi. The agent will resolve this matter by selecting or identifying himself. It's a type, if you wish. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a statement of who he is. By identifying himself with the parameter GIT, and again, this is simple, because it's a one-dimensional, just for the sake of discussion here. And that parameter, GIT, will pin down the perceived transition of all state variables for that individual. It will be his view of what the state of the economy is. We will assume anonymity. 
the agent doesn't assume that his own belief influences equilibrium prices. And I will argue in a second that indeed GI can be, for us, the scientists, is actually observable. And why is it observable? Because the way the agent will use his state of belief is by defining his perceived transition of that process this manner. Lambda VG will only be a, a, a parameter decides this, the, which chooses the orientation. If SI was supposed to be a state in which the economy is in good state, as it was in the previous uh, equation, then GVI will be positive. If SI is bad state, then G, uh, lambda VG will be negative. Otherwise, it, it, is, uh, it makes no difference. So the forecast of that individual will be lambda V, V plus this expression. If you compare this forecast with a forecast that he was make, would make under the known probability m, the known probability m, everybody knows it, and therefore you can then notice that the difference between the forecast of agent i and the stationary forecast m is exactly gi. Therefore, you can see from that that gi's are in fact observable. How do you observe them? Well, Everybody knows how to make this forecast. You go out and ask the individual, give you a forecast of the t plus 1. And the difference between them is the GI. So this fact that it's observable is important. But it also shows you what belief means in this theory. Belief is about deviation from the normal pattern which is established by the empirical frequency. Belief is how things are different than normal, how things are unusual, as uh, people say, this time is different. How, whether it is indifferent or not, that's what the agent is stating in this index. So what is the role of rationality? The role of rationality is to say what restrictions we're going to put in this S, this GI. I mean, if GI can be anything, then we can prove anything. And in this case, I'm going to spend a little time because there are certain variants in the theory of rational belief. There are certain variants, and I'll try to give you a sense of these, some of the variants in, in the treatment of this matter. Let me reduce it first to the two simple rationality principles. A belief cannot be constant, i.e., you don't change G equal to a constant unless it's zero unless you believe the empirical frequency is your belief. If you're going to say, I have a constant transition, it has to be the empirical fr uh, frequency, too. The second rationality principle says, I do not, you, an agent will not deviate from two in a consistent manner. Will never have always be optimistic. So G will always be positive. Or will never be always positive. Or it will not be allowed for him always to be negative or pessimistic. Now, it could be a possibility that you will start with a positive and then gradually converge to zero. This will also imply the same condition too, which is the requirement of unconditional expectation of equal to zero. But here I'm going to add the empirical reality that we observe in the data consistent diversity on any important matter. Consistent diversity, together with principle one and two, imply that GIs must fluctuate. And the role of rationality, is, in fact, is to explain what are the fluctuations in G. So what can I say about the fluctuations of G? Axiom three says G has to obey this transition. Why is that? Well, number one, because I want to. And I like it because it has three interesting properties. Number one, it establishes persistence. I will argue in a few minutes, and I will show you the data. I, I don't have experimental data, which experimental data, by the way, supports that as well. But the real data shows that persistence is very, very important phenomena, by far the most important phenomena. Secondly, it has an updating 
procedure by which the data is used to update the belief of what the belief tomorrow will be. And thirdly, it has a random component. So the, the history of the theory of Russian belief was at this point, the requirement for G was that an agent can choose any transition that can rationalize the data. What does it mean to rationalize? Remember, you take this transition four and you combine it with the law of motion here. In other words, this is the way the agent forecasts V. Put in here the G that comes from the transition, then rationalizability requires that this will imply the same empirical distribution as the data, which means the model, the subjective model of the agent is consistent with the data, full consistency with the data. That's what rationalizability means. So rationaliz rationalizability was one of the conditions, one of the conditions one can impose upon this is rationalizability. But I will come to this in a second. The more important fact is that data supports this relationship because, as I pointed out, we have data on the Gs and data on the Zs, on the aggregates of these, and in fact, we can estimate them. And in the paper with Motulese from 2011, we actually found that these numbers are pretty high. And I'll talk about these numbers in a moment. So first of all, the data supports condition like number four. However, as I just indicated, rationalizability would have required that the empirical distribution of this would be equal to this. Rationalizability is not easy and requires pretty steep work if you have V inside of the transition for G. And that so shows you that rationalizability is really not entirely compatible with updating. But that's not surprising. Because if, you, uh, if an agent uses his perceived model and updates it, the agent puts in his own model more volatility than nature has in the real data. And the rational agent will know that he puts some volatility in his perceived model in the form of this adjustment. So if that is the case, a rational agent would know that in fact there is more volatility in his model and would make uh, account for that. What's the main advantage of rationalizability? It puts severe restrictions on all the variances and covariances of the structure. Why? Why is that important? Let's go back to this model here. The agent will use his perceived value of G to forecast V, and ultimately it will become part of a rational a general equilibrium, it will be the basis for forecasting prices. And therefore, if you put no restrictions on the standard deviation of G, you have as much volatility as you want. There's no restriction in the model. Therefore, the key is to put restrictions on variances and covariances of the structure that will make the model apply to the data. And rationalizability does the job. On the other hand, if you just go to adaptation, which doesn't put uh, and, and formalize the, the learning or adapt adaptation process, it doesn't necessarily put any restrictions on what the fluctuation in G would be. In reality, we, if, we, if you, so what is this, the resolution that I adopt? I adopt a very pragmatic approach, and I adopt both. I will then argue in a second that I will prove condition three from Bayesian updating model. And I will then argue I use the rationalizability as a way of putting restrictions on the standard deviations and the covariances. In some models in which you, you use only linear approximation, it is the variances that matter, not covariances. But in this particular case, if you ignore the learning process, or the adaptation process, then you can prove a relationship between the standard deviation of G and the standard deviation of G, v, v. This comes for equation two. And that implies that that should be about 0.5, 0.05% for 
for GNP forecasts in, in the US. Uh, if V is viewed as a productivity. If you take V to, make, to mean its productivity for the US, that should mean that should be about 0.5%. So I'll use both the restrictions. I use the restrictions on rationalizability. And at the same time, I will move now to the third explanation, the third justification of this dynamics by using a Bayesian updating procedure. I'm sure that this will be more something to your likings because many of the people in this room are interested in learning models. So let me pro provide a justification, which is a Bayesian justification. So here, the agent will use two sources of data. So let me just point out two things. In a world of changing nature, changing institutions, changing technology, people receive more than just data. They see new computers, they see an iPhone, they see an IMAX, who knows what else we see in front of us, computers, steam engines, airplanes, jet engines, we see reality changing. So we have got a lot, lot of non-quantitative information. We've got lots of qualitative information about life around us. And we make inferences from this information as well. So there's data and qualitative information that goes hand in hand. And I will formulate a model which uses both. So the agents start by doing exactly what we started by saying, that this is basic model that he believes is the truth. He has a prior distribution on this random terms with uh, script theta as the, uh, as the precision for that. Then he has a prior distribution of st minus 1, which is this distribution with mean s and precision gamma of st minus 1. With this, once he has those two priors, he can proceed to make forecast of Vt. That's not a big deal. Just take the expectation of this thing. Now the data arrives. Vt arrives. Agents observe Vt. And they then compute the posterior on st minus 1. This is the posterior estimate. And this is the posterior distribution. And this is a standard textbook analysis. Here, notice there is a new precision. Now comes date t. Well, I'm sorry, date t arrived when vt, date t arrived, and v at time uh, arrived. But when date t arrived, notice something else changed because the structure of the economy could have changed. It is true that one of the things that I've experimented a great deal with is processes in S for processes with v that have different speeds. This is a rather complicated issue of working with models with different speeds, but just I want you to think about S as moving a little slower than V. So that the agent recognizes he has two, really two posteriors. He has a posterior that he obtained here by updating where he started from. But he also has qualitative information that says, you know, the world may have changed. And there's some things around you that suggest that maybe a little change. How do you incorporate that? Well, he uses this qualitative information to formulate an alternative prior distribution on S this time. And he already has a, this, a, a posterior that he obtained from ST minus 1. So he's got two sources that he needs to weigh. Well, like any good uh, uh, rational agent, what we are going to make is the assumption that he's going to take a weighted average of the two uh, uh, distributions. This is the distribution he obtained from the data. This is the prior he obtained from his own assessment. This is his own assessment. The way to think about this, this is all of them, all agents receive the same public information, qualitative information. This is his own subjective mean estimate. And this is therefore the way to interpret this parameter is a subjective interpretation of the reality around us. And therefore, this is the, uh, the uh, base estimate, which is the expected value of these two. This is the variance with the new precision. And now we go forward and iterate forward and repeat the process. Well, the theorem says that indeed the precision converges. As you know, for a martingale, R star has to be infinity, and it isn't. This thing does not converge. It it converged in law. It converged to a distribution. So that we now denote the estimate 
uh, expectation of st, so the expected s given the data and given the subjective assessment of reality around him, this becomes g. So now g has the exact interpretation of subjective estimate of expectation of s given what the agent knows. And lo and behold, the law of motion is exactly what I specified before. But now we're a little smarter because now we know that the persistence lambda z is exactly this ratio. And if the precision is high enough, this ratio will be bigger than 0.5. And for most interesting problems, you know, gamma star will be pretty high. And therefore, we'd expect under this theory that indeed this will be close to 1, not do it 0.5, but bigger than 0.5. We should also expect that the adaptation parameter would be small because you've got, you're dividing by a big number. And indeed, this should be something like maybe 0.1, 0.15, something like that. And finally, we use the principle of rationalizability to put a bound on the standard deviation of g, which is exactly 1 minus mu, the standard deviation of the variability in the mean estimates mu psi capital psi i. So this does not come from the Bayesian estimate. It comes from rationalizability. This comes from the Bayes estimate. I am using everything that I can. So market belief then is the distribution of the g's, and I assume the distribution is observable. And I need to bring the third and crucial component of the theory now to bear. I'm going to be, in many applications, uh, you know, uh, the cross-sectional, uh, I mean, in many applications, you want to look at models in which there is enough symmetry. So instead of looking at the full distribution, you can look at the, uh, 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 the, the moments of that distribution. And in the paper with Motolesi, where we, we use a lot of empirical work, we, use, uh, we certainly use the cross-sectional distribution. The cross-sectional standard deviation is very important. Here, I want to focus on the mean only. And z, which is the mean of the g's, is now obtained. The law of motion of z is obtained this way. And here, I'm now looking at the mean of the random term rho i uh, G, which is, uh, well, there's a missing, uh, um, yeah, okay, no, it's correct, correct notation. So here I'm using the same argument that my previous speaker spoke about, the importance of correlation, going back to Muth. Because all of the people here are receiving this, this remember, this is, this is information, this is estimates come from public information. All agents receive the same public information, and therefore their, their error terms are correlated. They're highly correlated. And therefore, the law of large number does not apply. So when you average across these things, you receive, you obtain a random variable, which is not zero. And that random variable, therefore, goes into the dynamics of z. So the mean market belief is, therefore, random and this is an interesting point in the theory because the correlation is a complete public good. It's a complete externality. There's no rational consideration that suggests why and how they should be correlated. But the correlation is very important. And indeed, in some paper, early paper with, uh, with Motolesi, we demonstrated that this, the changing correlation can actually exhibit stochastic volatility, which goes back to the previous discussion um, uh, that Monica asked regarding stochastic volatility. Well, stochastic volatility is generated right here. You can generate stochastic volatility by simply allowing the random terms to change in, in degree of correlation. Variation, time variability in the correlation will generate stochastic volatility. I'm not going to get into it now. So the possibility is that this will be time vari variable. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ignore it and then go into an empirical distribution. So that's the empirical distribution of the aggregate z, which is the mean of the g's. So now comes the crux of the whole theory, is we started with a single variable, but now we have two. The agents observe v, observe z, and the two variables, 
will end up being in the equilibrium map. At the end, the economy, what will you, will you write the equilibrium conditions and look at the, at the conditions of what the equilibrium map would look like, you will obtain two empirical distributions. The agent's perception model will consist of his belief in the random variable V, which is the exogenous shock, and his perception what that should be. But now he has to forecast also what Z will be. And again, the variability in Z may depend upon the state of the economy, and therefore it enters his belief as well. So now what happens is that the perception model, which is pinned down by the parameter G, has an equilibrium map which depends upon two variables rather than one, a fundamental one, which we are familiar with. But now there is another variable, Z, which will vary with time. And Kurtz and Wu paper in 1996 coined the term formalize the term of endogenous uncertainty to indicate that in this economy, for every value of V, for a fixed value of V, there will be many different prices. In fact, here there will be a continuum of prices for each value of V because of the variability of Z. So with this idea in mind, you realize that you can take that structure, which then you can graft into any model that you wish. I will make the assumption, for the sake of discussion, it doesn't have to be, there's not a necessary assumption, but one possible assumption that agents will know the equilibrium map, I will conduct a discussion for simplicity under the assumption that they know the equilibrium map, and then I will graft it on any model. Now, I want to point out to you that that model will not be an error de Bruijn equilibrium. It will not be an error de Bruijn economy, because in error de Bruijn economy, uncertainty exogenous. There's no such thing as future market belief. And the way to think about it, future market belief is the belief of others. Now, market belief is observable, and therefore there is no infinite regress here. You observe what it is, it's like any other a, a state variable. But it's a state variable that doesn't exist in the error de Bruijn economy. I believe this kind of economy is generically incomplete. Why? Because you cannot establish contingent claims which are contingent on the market belief because of two things. Number one, once you have a market like this, you're asking for distortions. Number two, Market belief can never be observed with complete precision, and you can never go to a judge and have a court about something that was measured on the basis of samples. And the law team tends to uh, uh, dislike that. Uh, so let me now go back to the key issue of persistence. It is so important in many applications that I would like to talk about some data which is useful. And I'm going to talk about data which is due to Kurtz Motor Lacey in 2011. So here's the data in which we constructed Z, which is the market belief for the economy at large. And it was extracted from three sources of data, federal fund rate, one year T-bills rate, and GDP deflators. So agents were asked to make forecast over these three variables. These three forecasts were made for either six months, which is two quarters, or 12 months, or 18 months for various periods. So I'm giving you now a table with forecasts with either 12, six months into the future or 12 months in the future. So for example, in this table, you are asked, what is the one-year treasury bill six months from now? Or what's the one-year treasury bills 12 years from now, 12 months from now? First of all, so the standard deviation of Z will correspond to the, uh, uh, to the standard deviation that I showed you before. And you can see that 0.5 was not a bad estimate. But much more important is the persistence. Look how persistent, highly persistent, lambda Z is. So the data exam exa uh, uh, shows substantial persistence. If you look at the data itself, this is the data of the estimated Zs. So the black line 
is the uh, six months forecast, and I believe that the blue lines is, uh, I'm sorry, yes, 12 months forecast. Uh, the 12 month for forecast, a little bit more uh, noisy, but the important thing is the persistence. Look, the slow moving uh, process based, uh, reflecting persistence. Here's the data here shows you the changes in the cross-sectional standard deviation. The cross-sectional standard deviation changes a lot, and you can see this is where stochastic volatility comes as well. Well, and you might say, well, you know, this, is, this came from your kitchen, you cook the data, there's a Zs and the M. Obviously, you had to use complicated stock, stock Watson techniques to estimate M. Uh, how, do you, how can you persuade me of persistence in some other way without using your kitchen? All right, so let's go to the actual data. I'm going to, to show you some raw data. I've got this, this chart that was prepared some time ago, but it's quite interesting, so I'm going to use it the way it is. So this is a bit, it's an episode. And I believe this episode is, 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 is significant in, it, in the fact that the episodes like this you will find in the data at all times. Agents were asked here to make forecast of GDP growth next year. I repeat, GDP growth next year. The data is obtained monthly, January, February, every month. Now, obviously, the data has uh, serially correlated because the data, the forecast in January and forecast in February and March, and they are serially correlated. But that doesn't matter. We're not worried about the serial correlation. The serial correlation you can obtain by, by looking at, at the fact that there is serial correlation in the data. Because what I want to compare is the forecast with the realization. Notice the important thing. This is the difference between the forecast and the stationary forecast. Realization is not here. There's no realization here. It's the difference between the forecast minus the stationary forecast M. Here we are looking at the difference between the forecast and the realization. Now, the bottom line is the 95th percentile. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the 5th percentile, the bottom 5th percentile, and the top is the 95th percentile upward. Now, the, since the, the forecasts are made for the whole year, the realization is a constant for the whole year. So if you put any date here, if you take any date here, which is 1990s, 93, for example, in May 1993, the forecast was made in May of 1992. The forecast was made a year before. And the date here is the date for which it was made. The realization, therefore, is a whole line like this because the realization is the actual growth rate for the years. So this is the different forecast distributions for the year at different times the prior year. And this is the realization for the year. So in the early 90s, there was a recession there. This is the Bush recession. The economy is in bad shape. Uh, forecasts uh, didn't do so well. So just uh, we recognize So this is the band of the forecasts, okay? The forecasts themselves. So the recession, they didn't quite get it. But once we got out of the recession, they're getting pretty well. Uh, now the realization is somewhere in the middle. Here the realization is somewhere in the middle. Uh, a little bit off. But something quite strange begins here around 1994, 93. The, the forecast distribution is over here. This is the forecast distribution. This is what the private forecasters are forecasting. The realization is over here. Look at this. For years after year after year, for six years, the economy is developed at a phenomenally high rate where the U.S. growth rate goes above 4%. And the forecasters are still sticking to their models. They're sticking to their models and adjusting very slowly. They're exhibiting enormous persistence. The paradox of this story is as they are moving and gradually adjusting their forecast up, coming to here, the realization gets hit here by the Bush recession. This is the, young, this is the old Bush, this is the young Bush recession. I'm not suggesting that they are irrational at all. I'm saying forecasting is a very difficult business. And if you think about it, these guys who are making forecasts for a year in advance, somebody make a forecast in March in 1992, he wouldn't know what the realization is 
not until March 93. Because you're making forecasts for 93. The GDP data for 93 will not be revealed until March of 94. It may take him a year and a half until he'll find out what happened. So this is a very slow and complex process. OK, now you will say, well, last objection. Uh, you know, these are private forecasters. They, 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 are, they, are, they are biased. They, they are, their data isn't accurate. We need smart people to do that. So let's look at the Federal Reserve. How about forecast of the Federal Reserve? Well, I don't have the Federal Reserve in this picture, but I have it here. So these are forecasts. The same thing, but this time, it is the top line is two standard deviations above the upper ones. This is the two standard deviations below the mean. So these are two standard deviations above the mean. This is two standard deviations below the mean. The first picture are the forecast for the same period for, I believe, for one quarter Hence, the forecast here is for two quarters in the future, and this is for next year. The dots in the middle are the forecast of the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve forecasts are exactly in the middle. The, no matter what you choose, it doesn't matter what you choose, you'll find the Federal Reserve forecasts are within these bands, which means the Federal Reserve is right there with them. So persistence is very essential. It's essential if you're going to look at any models of asset pricing, uh, 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 monetary policy, inflation. And so let's look at some applications. I want to spend a little time with applications. I'll go a little faster because I'm running out of time. So the first one is a asset pricing model. It's going to be essentially, it's a Lucas model, except the one thing I'm introducing an interest rate which will be a fixed interest rate R. So there's something people can put in the ground and get a, a riskless uh, uh, interest rate R. Again, the same picture. Uh, this is the empirical distribution. Uh, this is the, the, the truth. Uh, the agents have stock holding, bond holding, the price of the stock. Uh, I'm making a very easy assumption for myself because I want to be able to compute the equilibrium in closed form solution, and with a normal distribution, I choose the exponential. This is a heuristic discussion for pedagogical reasons, mostly. The usual budget constraint, consumption, purchases of stock and bonds, equal to what you get from your stock portfolio and your bond portfolios, and you maximize subject to your beliefs. The premium is the uh, price plus dividends. My, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot here. So here, V is the difference between dividends and mean dividends. Mu is the mean dividends, D is the dividends themselves. And so V is simply, I, I wanted to have a zero mean variable. So this is this difference. The premium itself is a price plus dividend minus R is R plus one, is interest rate plus one divided by the price. But as you know, the way to define the premium is really looking at the average the regression, you run a regression of all past data, which is exactly what the, the measure M here, the probability measure M. So under the probability M, this is the premium. I define H to be the excess returns per share. Sigma squared H is the return per share. Running out of time, there's some stability condition that I must skip. And here's the basic theorem. In this model, the equilibrium price is a linear function of the V and the Z. This is exactly what I mean by endogenous uncertainty. Endogenous uncertainty means variability of the price depend upon market belief. And market belief is as strong a force as the fundamental. Here, the coefficient AZ is positive because of the, mar of the orientation of the model. This was the consequence of that. Notice the premium, the solution of the premium, has two ways in which market belief enters the premium. First of all, it enters through the volatility of Z. Why? Because sigma squared H is the convex combination of the volatility of V and volatility of Z. So clearly, volatility, pure volatility of Z, market volatility, which is induced by market belief, is part of the premium. But there's a second component which is very interesting, and that is Z 
appears here as well, with A, Z positive, and R being bigger than 1, and lambda Z less than 1, or between 0 and 1. Uh, this thing is positive, which means that risk premium rises in sigma squared, and it falls with Z. If Z increases, the risk premium falls. That's a peculiar result, because it says that in, if you have an optimistic market, the long position is less than M risky. It's M risky, risky by the, con by the probability M. And it's awarded lower return by M. In a pessimistic market, the long position is more risky and awarded a higher return. What does it mean? The theorem says, translating it into, research, into investment strategy, and thinking about M as the long term, so to speak, averaging over a long term, if Z is positive, average of excess returns are higher if you're short. To make excess returns according to M, if Z is positive, if the market is optimistic, you have to go short. If Z is negative, which means if the market is pessimistic, you go long. Which means that under the probability M, investment strategy has to be a contrarian policy. You have to be against the market. This is very strange, because in a diverse belief model, agents have different beliefs, yet the investment strategy under M is to be contrarian. It's interesting because every agent is on his, as, as he's on his demand function. He already chose his demand function. So he doesn't make investment decisions according to M. He makes an important decision according to his own belief. These are not the same. Making an investment decision according to Q, making an investment decision according to M are not the same. And it's not optimal. If you have a belief Q, it's not optimal for you to be a contrarian because M strategy will require you to be long when you want to be short, or it won't make you want to be long when you want to be short. So the theorem brings out the complexity of asset management in which an agent is always struggling between his own belief and the long term assessment, which is sort of objective assessment of the long term. And in the long term, you may not make money. If you use the, 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 the various literature on bankruptcy, what happens to people in markets with diverse beliefs, what happened to the assets, say, I'm talking about Easley and his company, about uh, the assets of an agent who is speculating on the long term, since no one knows the truth, according to that theorem, the people who know the truth are going to assemble all the assets. They're going to accumulate all the assets. Since no one knows the truth, and any one of the agents might be close to the truth in his belief, following the strategy M wouldn't necessarily make you money. But it shows you why some agents in the market follow a contrarian policy, whereas others don't. Let me now quickly turn to the equity premium puzzle before I move to monetary policy. In, we started the equity premium puzzle with various models, at least three or four papers. We, so I'm going to report here on the paper from 2005 when we used a very similar model to the one I proposed here. These are calibrated models. V is now the growth rate of the dividend process of profits. So now V has a mean which is positive, V, v, v star mean. Uh, all of the computations were done with second order approximation, which means distribution and diversity mattered a great deal. And there, in this model, there are two types of models, and they have constant relative risk aversion, and the model was calibrated to the US economy. And so let me report the results of this calibration. What is essential in the equity prim premium puzzle is not to fit, not to create an equity premium. Equity premium, you could see from the model that I just presented, if you have enough volatility, you'll get an equity premium. There's no problem getting a, a premium out of it. The issue is to fit all nine uh, moments together at the same time, simultaneously. It turns out that in order to do that, you can't use the simple linear model that I presented. You have to twist 
the, in this equation, you have to twist the G and to introduce some nonlinearity. And the reason is this. In, when you look at asset returns, number one, asset returns are not symmetric. There's a, they lack symmetry. In the previous situation, this, the linearity implied symmetry, and it isn't. Secondly, they have fat tails, something that you wouldn't get from a normal distribution. So what the purpose was is to change the distribution of G, so the conditions for satisfying the equity premium, <coughs> equity premium puzzle, so to speak, was to only three conditions were necessary. Number one is to change the distribution to take away uh, mass from the center of the distribution, put more mass around zero and more mass at the tail. That's number one. Number two, to shift the distribution because one component in this model allows you to have asymmetry in the frequency of times at which, H, which agents expect to beat the S&P. See, beating the S&P is like being optimistic relative to M. Believing that you cannot beat the S&P is being pessimistic relative to M. So, at only 40% of the time, agents here believe that they can beat the S&P, or actually, that's not true, it's 30% of the time they believe that they can beat the S&P. The data, in the data, actually, agents beat the S&P, or the market beats the S&P, by about 10 to 20% time only. About 80% of the time, you don't beat the S&P. In other words, if you miss 60 days of the year in which the market rallies very rapidly, you lost all the excess returns. Secondly, we have to have a, 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 a little fat tails. And finally, the volatility of individual consumption to be, has to be slightly more the volatility of the average. And that's all these conditions are satisfied by simply introducing here a logistic function, transforming this with a logistic function and centering it off-center, moving it off-center. The paper explained it in more detail. So you introduce a logistic function, and then the model is fully rationalizable. So all the conditions, the volatility conditions, and, and variances and covariances have been restricted. Um, so with a little time left, I want to talk a little bit about monetary policy very quickly. So I'm OK with time, because I was promised to use uh, an hour and 20 minutes, right? So I'm OK. So in order to uh, deal with, uh, uh, as, I, as I pointed out, the idea was to construct a theory that can be grafted into, a, into any general equilibrium uh, structure. So I'm using here a standard, uh, I mean, I suppose standard today is, is, uh, is Mike. Mike has become standard. Sorry, I have to brand you that way, but your book has become the standard reference. So I'm using essentially the standard uh, uh, established by Mike by writing down a simple uh, new, uh, new Keynesian model with uh, money ultimately being a cashless economy. Uh, the demand for, uh, so, so there's a production function here which is linear in labor utility of consumption, labor, and money. Uh, the budget constraint, the usual budget constraint, where I introduce here transfers. So this is consumption, money holding, bond, transfers. On the income side, you've got wage income, uh, bond payments, money agents, and profits from ownership of intermediate production. The JATH agent produces the intermediate product, J. And the agent writes down his uh, Euler equations, bond purchases, labor, money. The economy itself is an economy consistent of small monopolistic competitors who are producing intermediate goods, CIJ. The CJT is the consumption good, which is an average of the intermediate goods. The price level P is the average of the, or this average, of the prices of intermediate goods. Uh, there's sticky prices, 
I'm not going to go into the details of it. There is caliper pricing mechanism by which a certain fraction of firms cannot change prices at any moment of time. Uh, because those firms who cannot change prices have a disadvantage, they automatically the caliper pricing mechanism creates income effects. To avoid these income effects and maintain simplicity, I introduce an insurance assumption in which although a firms maximize, choose the optimal pricing in accordance with the model that I just wrote, the actual profits they receive is equal share of aggregate profits in the economy. After log linearizing the economy, you write down the conditions and it's easy to prove that there exists a microeconomic equilibrium. And a microeconomic equilibrium means in that equilibrium, each agent optimizes given his belief. The central bank chooses a nominal interest rate rule, and the market's clear. Consumption equal output. Aggregate debts equal to zero because the debts here are in zero net supply. Now, I want to point out an important fact, that in models with diverse beliefs, like this one, a competitive equilibrium is not Pareto optimal. Now, this fact was known for a long time. Actually, Peter Hammond wrote in 1981 an important paper proposing the concept of exposed Pareto optimality. Uh, our friend Nielsen, who is with us today, written several papers on the question, and I believe he will talk about it this afternoon. That, is, that was true uh, of the previous model before, because what happens is this, with diverse belief, you generate all these additional volatility, additional risk. Diverse belief generate volatility and risk, and that risk is undesirable by anyone. So in this type of modeling, Market belief is an externality. It's an externality which is undesirable collectively. And the central bank will have to deal with that, as I will point out in a second. And the economy, the agents suffer from that. They suffer the consequence of their collective uh, beliefs, if you wish. And as a result of that, Pareto optimality is, is lost. Now, to show you the relationship of this to the aggregate macroeconomic modeling, which is familiar from the work in the last uh, 10, 15 years, we'll define why to be the deviation of aggregate output from steady state. Pi hat is actually inflation because the steady state inflation is zero. And then I have the fable, the simple theorem that says the following. In the microeconomic equilibrium, there exist parameters by and b pi such that the is curve is exactly the same as it is in Mike's book, except now there is this term by multiplied by z that appears here. And the Phillips curve is exactly the same as in the standard model, except that now there is this new term here. And most important is that these two parameters depend upon the policy rule in place. So this is the policy rule that I'm assuming here. It doesn't matter. I mean, the theorem can be modified for various, virtually any policy rule. So the parameters b, y, p, pi depend crucially upon the policy parameters. By the way, this is not true when you don't have diverse beliefs. Under rational expectations, those z terms to disappear, and none of these parameters depend upon the policy. This is the advantage of rational expectations, because it gives you a structure which is independent of the policy. Here, in some sense, there is an interaction between the microequilibrium and the macroequilibrium. Every time the policy is changed, the macroeconomic equilibrium changes, which is exactly what Lucas intended to say. But what has really changed here is something else. Central bank policy really changed. The problem of central bank now changed dramatically from my perspective. Because the, the small exogenous shock 
V that I've been talking about all along, on the rash in, in, in the RBC literature, this is big. The standard deviation of that is something like it's almost three quarter of a percent. And that's enough to give the model a lot of kick. Now, I believe, and I, I, th I think there's a support to that in the literature, that this standard deviation of that should be much, much smaller than that, maybe 0.2 percent, maybe 0.3 percent, which means the bulk of the fluctuations are caused by the Z, not by the V. So the central bank is now facing not exogenous shocks, but, but volatility which is dominated by expectations. So stabilization policy of the bank must face the problem of expectations uh, uh, and, and therefore volatility due to expectations is at least as important as sticky prices. Sticky prices is the thing that gives rise to this model. In fact, in the paper that I cited earlier, the Kurtz, Gene, and Motolesi, which I mentioned earlier, we don't have sticky prices at all because it's easy to show that under diverse beliefs, uh, money is not neutral and, market and, 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 and bank policy is, is, is a monetary policy efficacy is, is, is available under diverse beliefs anyway. So I think that sticky prices is a genuinely good assumption. But I don't think that sticky price is the only thing that causes difficulty with the central bank. What I'm proposing is that diverse beliefs is more important than the sticky prices because the diverse belief forces the central bank to recognize the fact that it's functioning on the opposition. And it's exactly the, t the title of our network, Uncoordinated Expectations. Yes, the central bank is faced correlated but uncoordinated opposition. And it is this that makes the central bank's job so difficult. So what is the effect of all that on, on the behavior, on, on the issue? So let's, what's the beef, so to speak? So let me take one subject, I'll take one subject, and that is the trade-off between inflation volatility and output volatility. So let's look at the trade-off the bank is facing between output volatility and inflation volatility. This is the standard question being asked when one formulates a policy and optimal monetary policy pretty much deals with that question. Under rational expectations, without any, so notice that I have a policy shock U here, and it's just the policy shock is just a way of getting a shock into the uh, IS curve because there's already a shock in the V, in the, in the monetary, uh, in, the, in the Phillips curves. This brings a shock, put the, put the R in here, and you get a shock in both equations. So we'll start with a shock without a shock in the IS curve. So here is the trade-off on the rational expectations without a shock in the IS curve. First of all, I want you to uh, be aware of the fact, something that at least I was not aware of it, I don't know if you're aware of it, that this, the new Keynesian model is extremely sensitive to the structure of shocks. You put large shocks, different shocks, and the structure of the model changes a lot. And you have to be very careful where you were using those shocks. So to convince you of that, I'm going to try to get to back to this model, and I'm going to introduce that shock U and examine what happens under rational expectations. So notice, without the U shock, there's a clear trade-off here. And for each C pi, which is the weight on inflation, or Cy, there's a point at which along this curve that you can choose. If you introduce the shock U with a large shock, look what happened. The, for each weight on income, I'm sorry, for each weight on price, C pi, you've got this long curve here that actually goes all the way to infinity with converging to zero. So all these curves go like that. And in fact, there's no trade-off. There's no trade-off in the sense that we just had. Because for each value of, for each value of y, if you can increase C pi, you will move the curves this way. All these curves will move this way, and you will get continuously steeper and steeper curves. So first of all, the model is very sensitive to the structure of shocks. So this is a beginning point. This is under rational expectation. I haven't done anything yet to talk about diverse beliefs. 
So now let's bring in the di diverse beliefs model. And this model was reasonably calibrated by the parameters that I discussed. All the parameters in the model are either taken from Mike's book or were taken from the estimates that I discussed before or for the belief model. And here is the picture that I want to explain to you. So first of all, there are three pictures here. We'll start thinking about a table in which I'm picking the weight on output. Central bank puts a given weight on, on, on not in output, I'm sorry, on inflation. Again, C pi is fixed. And I'm changing the weight on output. So I'm starting here from a negative weight on output, and I am increasing the weight on output. Notice at the beginning I have an inefficiency, complete inefficiency, because I'm reducing the volatility of inflation and the volatility of output both. So there is a segment here which is an inefficient segment. So given that level of C of pi, just increase C of Y until you get to the bottom, to, the, to a minimum point. Then the curve turns around, and there is a little range here of an actual trade-off. And then it turns around and then offers a different trade-off. So this is one slice of the frontier by choosing a fixed weight on inflation and varying the weight on output. You get this kind of curve. So now, supposing you vary output, I believe, in the, the weight on, on, uh, on inflation between minus 0.9 and 5. All of these satisfy stability, the, the, the determinacy conditions. So the determinacy conditions are always satisfied on everything being done here. And the weight on pi between, uh, I believe, what is it? Um, between 1.1 and 5. So there's a limited range. So you'll see what happens here is there's a lot of points here which are inefficient. And there's a minimum point here in which essentially you put no weight on output and you put a lot of weight on inflation. I think of this as the European Central Bank. So this is the bank that has only one objective. It wants to, con con to control inflation by smashing expectations. And indeed, it succeeds. It succeeds in the sense that it cuts down inflation quite a bit, but the model shows there is a lower, lower upper bound, but there is a lower bound as far as it, it can reduce the volatility of output. And then, as you choose different uh, 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 different values of the, of the policy parameters, you then trace an alternative curve <coughs> in which there is a larger trade-off between inflation and volatility. In this, in this range, there is, this is the common uh, uh, dual-purpose uh, central bank, which struggles with between the uh, control of inflation and control of output, but it's the control of the output which is the hard one. It's the control of the output that generates all the complexity, as you can see from this diagram. So first of all, the first conclusion of the diverse belief model shows there is a difference between a central bank that only wants to crush expectations by using powerful anti-inflation policy and a central bank that wants to, trade, to have a trade-off between output and inflation. But here comes the crux of the matter. While this, they are actually trading off output, aggregate output and aggregate inflation, there is a real complication about the volatility of consumption. Because individual consumption and output is not the same. This is an economy with diverse beliefs, diverse agents. They have different bond holdings. They have different portfolios. And we find out that the, if you look at the volatility of the trade-off between inflation volatility, inflation volatility, I'm sorry, this is, in, what do I have here in the picture? Uh, it's very small. Okay, so this is, uh, so this is consumption volatility and this is inflation volatility, I'm sorry. If you take the same value of the parameters and map the, uh, 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 volatility of individual consumption and volatility of inflation, you get this cluster. This cluster corresponds to this cluster here. You can see very clear trade-off between 
inflation volatility and consumption volatility. So consumption volatility and output volatility are different things. The central bank, which is concerned with the volatility of the periphery, which are the individuals in the periphery, uh, is not the same central bank that's concerned with the volatility of the mean. So now the question is, what is the effect? What is the right policy, so to speak? And to this, I'm going to go to this last curve. This is going to be my last picture. And in this picture, what I have done here is I do not control only output. I control output and actually control directly the shocks themselves. So monetary policy controls output, market belief, and the shocks themselves. And indeed, then you get a very nice trade-off between inflation and consumption. And the, this is the same trade-off that we had before, but much, much cleaner and, and easier. But in the top one, I'm using only modest variables, modest values of the parameters. Most crucially, the weight on inflation. The weight on inflation is only allowed to be between 1.1 and 2.1. So the weight on inflation is modest. All the other parameters are modest in value. Now I toss in one value of inflation at 30, a weight of inflation 30, xi pi equal to 30. And these are the extra points that you get here. Very low inflation, but extremely high consumption volatility, which means that the central bank that will try to crush expectations by controlling only inflation will end up with very large volatility of consumption. I don't, I don't proposing that the diverse belief here represents Greece and, and Ireland and Portugal. I'm not proposing that at all. But I'm proposing that the central bank that is only single, motivated by a single factor, will end up finding itself with the periphery, in this case consumption, which is not attended to because it's a taking a policy which is far too extreme. Um, so I have shown three applications where uh, we have used the diverse belief model in different, uh, these are different applications. I think that I can summarize by saying that I think the age of rational expectations is coming to an end. And I think that the uh, Financial crisis that we've gone through is an interesting one because we've seen a gigantic crisis without any exogenous shock that I know about. And to my mind, what caused the financial crisis is the failure of agents to forecast the price of houses. And it's the failure of to forecast the prices of houses which caused all the financial disturbances that com came from that. This is a highly it's a financial crisis generated by internal forces, by endogenous forces, not by exogenous forces. And that's the reason why I think this type of reasoning that I'm proposing will ultimately be a more useful one to look at this and understand the crisis. Thank you.